Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Salah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is open. Everything will change. And, you know, God is just so amazing. What a mighty God we serve. And I'm just so thankful for who he is because he has already told us everything that we are witnessing before our very eyes. And we can't go off script. Hallelujah. You see, God has told us beforehand everything that is going to happen so that we would understand that God is our refuge. Therefore, we will not fear, okay? Because he is a very present help in times of trouble. You see, because what's about to happen has been told to us from the beginning. And what's about to happen is that the earth is going to be removed. Uh, what's about to happen is that the mountains are gonna be carried into the midst of the sea. What's about to happen is that the waters are going to roar and the mountains are going to shake with the swelling thereof. You see, but God says for those who understand, for those who have been born again, for those who have the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, we will never fear. You see, because fear has to do with torment. Fear has to do with punishment. And God says that the fear, the pit, and the snare will be for the inhabitants of the earth. In Isaiah chapter 24, it talks about how when God comes down on the cloudy and dark day, how the whole world is going to be flipped upside down from his visitation. And God says that for all the inhabitants of the earth, everyone who is left behind, God says that the fear, the pit, and the snare will be upon everyone who is left behind in the cloudy and dark day. And the Bible says that for those who run from the sound of the fear, they will fall into a pit. And for those who climb out of the midst of the pit, once they climb out, the Bible says they will be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high will be opened and the foundations of the earth will shake. You see, in the cloudy and dark day, uh, there is no escape. In the cloudy and dark day, if you are left behind as an inhabitant of the earth, there is nowhere to run. There will be nowhere to hide. 
And I want to give encouragement to the body of Christ that we have a very present help in times of trouble. And that time of trouble is about to spring upon this world like a trap. But for us in the body of Christ and for you who may be listening that is teeter-tottering on the fence, I want to give encouragement from the word of God to let us continually see how God has made a way of escape. Because we're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are not to fear because we are not going to be left behind when the fear comes, okay? We are going to be caught up. The first event that happens on the cloudy and dark day will be the rapture of the church. That's the first event that's going to happen on the cloudy and dark day. On the cloudy and dark day, the rapture of the church will be the first event. And it's going to be a regular day, just like today. It's going to be business as usual, just like today. And suddenly, there's going to come the sound of a trumpet. And when that sound of the trumpet rings loud, the whole world is going to hear it. But only those who are dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then there's going to come another sound of a trumpet. And for those who hear it, who are alive and remain at that very moment, instantaneously, we're going to be caught up. Hallelujah. And we're going to escape into the Father's house. And I want to go over how we see these two trumpets in the book of Joel. I've gone over these two trumpets numerous times, but, you know, uh, I want to continue to go over it because it continues to be brought up in the scriptures because God tells us the end from the beginning. And therefore, what God has told us in the Torah is going to be repeated in the New Testament so that his word will uh, be confirmed out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, but his witness is enough. Hallelujah. He's God all by himself. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. His witness, his witness is all that we need. Hallelujah. But uh, God is so good that he used 40 different authors to pin a, the same continual message that agrees in every point. Hallelujah. And so at the beginning of the Bible, he tells us about the calling of the assembly with two silver trumpets. But I want to just highlight this verse because we're going to see some things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8, when God is telling us that uh, the most desirable gift is to prophesy, it's better than speaking in tongues. And so the Apostle Paul is telling us that, you know, we should desire to prophesy. And the good news is that uh, the testimony of the Lord is the spirit of prophecy. And so uh, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, hallelujah, we have the spirit of prophecy. And with the spirit of prophecy, we tell the world what God has already said. You see, uh, this is so good. And I'm, I'm thankful for my sister Frances as she brought this to my memory. Uh, you know, we all have at least one talent, hallelujah. And one of the talents that we have definitely is the ministry of reconciliation because we are all ambassadors for Christ, hallelujah. We're all ambassadors for Christ and therefore he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's a talent. And that talent is is to go out into all the world and declare the gospel to every creature, making disciples of all nations, teaching and commanding them to obey all that he has commanded us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, baptizing them. Hallelujah. And so as ambassadors for Christ, we are in Christ's stead telling the world to be reconciled back to him. That's a talent given to us by the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit is in us, which is the spirit of prophecy as well, we're telling in that gospel message that Jesus Christ is coming back. Some may go or have a, a more larger portion of the spirit of prophecy, which is able to 
bring out what God has said on uh, richer levels in order to edify the body of Christ, but the spirit of prophecy alone, which declares that Jesus Christ is coming again, has been given to all born again believers. Hallelujah. And so with the talent that God has given us, which is to be his ambassador, we are to be kingdom builders. Hallelujah. We are to be vocal about our faith. Hallelujah. No matter if you stand on a street corner and you preach the gospel or if you send out emails and preach the gospel or you send text messages and preach the gospel or you tell people who you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis and preach the gospel or you get on YouTube and preach the gospel, as long as you're somehow, some way telling people about Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, how he died, was buried, and on the third day rose again for the remission of sins, conquering death, and giving eternal life to whosoever will come. As long as you're telling people that message and that he's coming again in order to receive the church to himself and to begin the great and dreadful day of the Lord where he will usher in his everlasting kingdom. As long as you're telling people that, however God has gifted you to tell it, you're fulfilling your ambassadorship. You're using the talent that God has given you because we all have a talent. But as the parable tells us, some people have more talents. Some people may have five talents. Some people may have two talents, but we all have at least one talent. And one of those talents is to preach him. Hallelujah. One of those talents is to declare what thus saith the Lord. Therefore, the question is, are you fulfilling that task? Only you and God knows that. And, you know, uh, praise God. Uh, I don't know why that came up, but it came up. And so here, I, I laid it out on the table. God is good. Oh, y'all yeah, speaking about 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the gift of prophecy. But back to the lesson, hallelujah. The lesson that I want to highlight is about this trumpet sound, okay? This trumpet sound that Paul tells us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8. He tells us this. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Okay. Uh, and so while in the context, I've already went over it, God is trying to illustrate how the gift of prophecy is the, more, is the most desirable gift, even over tongues. He's using this analogy, this illustration to illustrate how when a trumpet gives a sound, it gives a distinct sound in order for the people to understand what the trumpet is telling us to do. And so this comes into effect when we get to the book of Joel. And so in the Old Testament, uh, in the Torah, God tells us about the two silver trumpets that were made. And these two silver trumpets that were made gave distinct sounds in order to let the camp of Israel know what they had to do. And so when all of the congregation was to gather together, the two silver trumpets were blown. So the first trumpet was blown and the last trumpet was blown. One and two, there was two silver trumpets. So there's a first trumpet, there's a last trumpet. First trumpet, last trumpet, two silver trumpets. We read here in Numbers chapter 10, verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make you two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shall you make them, that you mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to you at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So when the first trumpet is sound and when the last trumpet is sounded, all the congregation of the house of Israel were to gather together at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Because God tells us the end from the beginning, we see the first and the last trumpet blown in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, here we see the first trumpet blown. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. The one who was speaking to John is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who goes on to declare that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And he has a message to give to the seven churches. And another interesting caveat when this first trumpet is heard by John as he's in the spirit is that when he heard this first trumpet, he fell down as dead. We see this in verse 17, chapter one of the book of Revelation. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And so we know from the book of uh, 1 Corinthians that when the trumpet sounds, um, or I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians, uh, when that trumpet sounds, that first one, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Hallelujah. And so we see here in the book of Revelation chapter 1, when the first trumpet sounds, John falls at the Lord's feet as though he were dead. So that represents the dead in Christ rising up first, okay? And so further on into the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, we get the second trumpet, which is the last trumpet. Two trumpets are sounded, okay? Just as Numbers chapter 10 tells us, and as 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tells us that the trumpet has to give a distinct sound so that we will know what to do. And so that trumpet that gives a distinct sound is illustrated in the Bible as being the first and the last trumpet, which goes back to Numbers 10 and the two silver trumpets. And when both are blown, all the congregation gathers before the door of the tabernacle, which is what is going to happen on the cloudy and dark day when the rapture of the church occurs. Revelation chapter 1 illustrates the dead in Christ rising first when that first trumpet sounds. And then Revelation chapter 4 represents those who are alive and remain and we go before the door of the tabernacle and we are ushered in into the father's house by the son of man jesus christ look at this revelation chapter 4 verse 1 after this i looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which i heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show you things which must be hereafter. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a day. What a day. What a day. The first day of forever. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait. The first day of forever as we behold the king never, ever, ever to be separated from seeing him face to face. But we will behold him. And we will admire his splendor. We will rejoice in his glory. We will sing praises forever and ever because he has did it. Hallelujah. It's already done. <laughs> God is good. He said he's finished the work even before the foundations of the world. When it was just him. Hallelujah. <laughs> When it was just him, because he is the great I am. When it was just him, when it was just the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. And it was all that was love, all that was joy, all that was peace. It was all that was fellowship. He needs nothing, hallelujah. <laughs> he says, if I was hungry, I would not tell you, okay? His days can't be searched out. He is the everlasting God. Who can compare to him? Hallelujah. Way back in eternity past, when it was just him, hallelujah, and he was God all by himself, and he's the same God today all by himself, hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. When it was just him, my friend, he had already finished the works. <laughs> he had already finished the work. Oh my goodness. Who can compare to him? You think that when it was just him all by himself that he did not already finish the work? You think that it was when it was just him that he didn't already know who was going to be saved and who was going to be lost? He knows all. He understands all. He sees all. 
There is no wisdom, no might, or counsel against the Lord. Of course he knew it all. It's his plan. Hallelujah. And this is the best plan. Hallelujah. You see, let me just go down this little rabbit hole right quick. You see, God, because he is from everlasting to everlasting, back when it was just him, and he was calculating all the plans that he could have done, and it would all have been good, hallelujah, because God is good. When he was calculating all the plans, hallelujah, and what he wanted to do when he wanted to make creatures, this existence, both the angelic and the human part, was the best plan out of all the possibilities. This plan was the best plan. Therefore, no one can charge God with folly. Because the Bible tells us that everything that God does is good. And this plan, even though he allowed sin to get into this world, when he first allowed it to get into heaven through that rebel angel, Lucifer, this was the plan that was going to be the best plan. This was the plan that God ordained for it to come to pass. Because this plan which is almost at the final point of execution. <laughs> Hallelujah. All of this rebellion that we see, all of this jibber-jabber, all of this hate, all of this wickedness is only for a sliver of time. It's only for a moment, my friends. And once God accomplishes his perfect work, because the Bible tells us that he's going to make a quick work. <laughs> it's going to be done quick, fast, and in a hurry. Hallelujah. He's going to bring out the broom of destruction. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. And when he brings out that broom of destruction, oh my goodness. He's going to make a quick work. <laughs> he's going to make a quick work. It's going to be a short work. Hallelujah. It's a short work that he's going to accomplish at the end of the age. It's going to be a short work. But that short work is only a sliver of time. And in that sliver of time, God is going to do his cleanup job. And once his cleanup job is over, the Bible tells us that we'll not even remember anything evil, wicked, dishonorable, wretched, sinful. It will never even come to our mind. We won't even remember all of the trials, all of the tribulations, all of the anguish, all of the hurt, all of the struggle. We won't even remember it. It will never come to mind. Can you imagine? My goodness, it makes your heart wrench at the goodness of God that he would even allow us to taste and see that he is good, that he would even think on us, that he would even look at us. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. What is man that you are mindful of him, the Bible says. When you just think about the glory and the greatness and the majesty of the Almighty and you think and you reflect in the recesses of your soul and you think, why would he look at such a person as me? A wretched man, a wretched woman. Why would he even look at me and consider me to even come near to his presence? Oh, it makes your heart wrench that this God, the only God, the true and living God, would go to such great lengths in order for us to taste and see that he is good. <laughs> it's just mind-boggling when you put your mind up there where he's at and just to think about his glories. And he would look down upon me and you and say, you know what? I want that person who I made in my image and after my likeness, I want him to reflect my glory. I want that woman 
to reflect my glory. I want them to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I want them to be an exact replica, an exact reflection, because there will be nothing that is defiling that will ever enter into the everlasting kingdom of God. Hallelujah. We have to be like him. Hallelujah. Like him in perfectness and righteousness. Of course, he's always going to be God. But we have to have his same nature of holiness. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We have to have his righteousness because without righteousness, we can't enter into the kingdom. And all of that is given to us when we are born again. All of that is given to us in the great exchange. It's the greatest transaction in human history. Nothing can compare to the greatest transaction in human history. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, when God was in Christ on the cross, not counting our sins against us, but he was reconciling the world unto himself. The Bible tells us it pleased the Father to crush him. Can you imagine? It pleased the Father to crush him. Can you imagine? It pleased the Father to crush him. Oh, my goodness. And yet he did it for me and you. The Father crushed the Son of God on the cross for me and you. You want to know how God deals with sin? You want to know what God does to sinful people? If they ain't born again, <laughs> look at what he did to his only begotten son on the cross. That's how God deals with sin. Ooh, he drank the whole cup of the wrath of God. He drank it all, even the very last drop. He drank it all. You want to know how God deals with sin? Oh, you got to look at that cross. You got to look at what he did to his only begotten son. He spared him not, but he gave him up in order for me and you to taste and see that he is good. If God went to such great lengths to save us, <laughs> imagine what he's going to do to those who reject him. Imagine what he's going to do to those who reject him. Oh my goodness, I imagine it. I imagine it when I read that lake of fire. I imagine it, my goodness. Oh my goodness, I imagine it because I don't want to go there. And by the grace of God, hallelujah, he saved me from such a terrible fate. But I still contemplate it. I contemplate that lake of fire. My goodness. And I come to the conclusion that everyone who goes there is worthy because God said so. God said so that everyone who rejects him is worthy because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, it, it's just so amazing. Oh, I, I've just, I just, you know, I haven't made a video in like a week, so, you know, since I preached, so I guess, you know, I just have all these things to say. And I want to get to this lesson, but God is leading me here. But let me just say this. I said we're going to go down a little rabbit trail, but I pray that this is edifying because it's edifying to me. Uh, but it's like this, my friends, my beloved friends. You see, it always starts in the spiritual. You see, when sin came into the world, hallelujah, in the Garden of Eden, it was because our first parents rebelled against the commandment of God. It was because our first parents ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate from that fruit off that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And God said that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. <laughs> you see? And when our first parents ate, they died spiritually that day. That very day in the spirit, they died. That's why we all turn back to dust. And that is why without Jesus, we will die forever in the lake of fire. Because it always starts in the spiritual. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but our fight is against spiritual powers in heavenly places. Principalities, powers, workers of iniquity, wicked spirits that rebelled in the spiritual world first. You see, it even goes back further <laughs> than the garden when we talk about the rebellion, because it always starts in the spiritual realm. And so that first rebellion, which happened in eternity past through that chief rebel, Hasatan, who's a wicked and evil spirit, he convinced one third of all the other rebel angels to follow him. And so rebellion started in the spirit. And then when they came to earth and Satan influenced our first parents, Adam and Eve, to rebel, God said that in the day that they eat of the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. When they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they died. Spiritually, spiritually, they died. They died. That is why we're all born spiritually dead. <laughs> we're all born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. We're born from the womb as rebels because we're spiritually dead. We run from the light. We want nothing to do with the light. It's only when we're born again that now we have spiritual life. You see, it starts in the spiritual and then it manifests in the physical. And it's like what we're seeing right now. We're seeing all the chess pieces being set up and it's a lot of war of words, but it's, a, it's symbolic of what's going on in the spiritual realm, okay? Because uh, it has to start in the spirit first and these war these war of words that we see with Iran and, and uh, uh, the United States and, you know, Israel, you know, it's, it's all talking, 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 talking. And that represents the spiritual world that is moving the chess pieces for that great and dreadful day. But when it's time for that trumpet to sound, <laughs> uh, hallelujah, then it's going to manifest into this physical world. You see, it always starts off spiritual and then it comes into the physical, it manifests. And so when this final act is played out, it's really gonna manifest because when these two trumpet sounds startle not only the earth, but also the heavens, the spiritual world is going to manifest into the physical. And that's what we see in the book of Joel, hallelujah. In the book of Joel, we see these two trumpets, hallelujah. We see these two trumpets. I was going to go a little bit deeper into Joel, but let me just bring out these highlights and I'll go back uh, this time. In the book of Joel, I just want to stick with these two trumpets. We see the two trumpets. Verse 1, Joel chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Okay, so that's the first trumpet. And then Joel chapter 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. And look what he says happens when that second trumpet is blown. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Everyone, everyone who's been born again, hallelujah, even the kids. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. <laughs> it's the rapture, my friends. <laughs> it's the rapture, 
my friends. You see, when that second trumpet blows, let me go back, first trumpet, Joel chapter 2, verse 1, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, that's one trumpet. Joel chapter 2, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, that's the last trumpet. When two trumpets are sounded, according to Numbers chapter 10, all the congregation assembles to the door of the tabernacle. The book of Revelation, first trumpet, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. John hears it, he falls down as dead. The dead rise first. Revelation chapter 4, those who are alive and remain, the second trumpet sounds, they're told to come up here. And what happens when they come up? They assemble before the door and the door is open and they go into the Father's house. And the first thing that we will see when we go into the Father's house is a throne that is going to be set in heaven. That's what we're going to see. When we're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, when we see the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the first thing that we're going to see when we go into the Father's house is the throne of God. <laughs> we ain't going off script. We ain't going off script. This is what is going to happen when we go through that door. I just imagine it somehow, some way in my puny mind. I imagine it, but I know my imagination is so far feeble from the actual reality. But when we see it, oh my goodness, the splendor of just going through the doors. Oh my goodness. I get chills thinking about it and to behold his glory. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, what, what, does, what, did, what did the psalmist say? When I went into the house of the Lord, then understood I their end. <laughs> you see, once we go into the house of the Lord, then we will understand the end of the wicked. Oh, because there's coming a separation, my friends. A separation on the cloudy and dark day. And then when that separation happens, we will understand because we will understand just as God understands. We will see just as God sees because right now we see through a glass dimly. Hallelujah. But then, face to face. Oh, what an awesome God we serve. You see, when this second trumpet sounds in the book of Joel, we see that the bridegroom goes forth out of this chamber. And we know that the chamber that the bridegroom is in is in the father's house. That's the third heaven. And so when he comes out of the chamber of the third heaven, the door is going to open and he's going to come down into the second heaven where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. And so when he comes down into the second heaven, he's going to be on the clouds. Woo, my goodness, you better be caught up. <laughs> you better be caught up on that day, my goodness. You better be caught up on that day when God comes out of his chamber. <laughs> when God comes out of his chamber, he's going to awake like one awakens from sleep, but he never sleeps or slumbers. But that's how the psalmist puts it. He, when he awakes, he's going to despise the image of all the wicked. <laughs> all the wicked who are made in the image of their father, the devil. He's going to despise their image. You see, before because the wicked, uh, they don't see the true and living God moving right now <laughs> they think he's slumbering if they even believe that he exists but deep down in their soul they know <laughs> they know but they suppress the truth in unrighteousness <laughs> they know that there is a god but they worship the god of this world knowingly or unknowingly all the wicked worship the god of this world knowingly or unknowingly because the bible tells us that what's the first commandment? The first commandment is that we shall have no other gods before him. <laughs> if you put anything else above Jesus, God says you're an idolater. You're worshiping the God of this world. 
indirectly or directly, you are worshiping Hasatan. That is why idolatry is the worst. It's the worst because it's the number one thing that God says do not do. It's the first commandment. You shall not worship any other gods before me. Anything that you put instead of God, whatever it is, I don't care what it is. And God, he's the judge. <laughs> he, of course, doesn't care what it is. If you try to replace him with anything else but him, there's hell to pay. And he ain't going to cut anyone any slack. The only way <laughs> is to be covered by the blood. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. And if you're covered by the blood, you're not going to be an idolater. <laughs> you're not. What does the temple of God have to do with idols? Nothing. Okay. You're not going to be an idolater because you've been born again by the blood of Jesus. And when you've been born again, God is on the throne. That's why he says we decrease so that he can increase. We humble ourselves so that he can exalt us. Because God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we see that when the bridegroom comes into this world, when he comes out of his chamber, out of the father's house, when he comes into this world, Literally. I mean, he's already here. Of course, he's he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. But right now, he hides his glory. <laughs> he hides his glory. and He doesn't manifest his glory. And even on the cloudy and dark day, he's given mercy. He's giving mercy to those who are left behind. Because if he didn't hide his glory, behind the clouds, even though his visible presence will be felt by everyone. <laughs> because everyone is going to shake. <laughs> everyone who's not built upon the rock, you will shake. It is a guarantee. You will shake. <laughs> you will shake. No ands, ifs, or buts about it. And the sad reality is that many people will be shaken all the way down to the flames of hell. Because they're going to be swallowed up in the judgment. <laughs> but for those who survive the cloudy and dark day. For those who survive the cloudy and dark day. Which is just the beginning. Ooh, that day is a day of trouble. For those who survive it. God has given you grace. God has given that person grace. He's given that person mercy <laughs> because he shielded his glory with the clouds. Because if God were to appear at the time of the rapture and he did not wrap himself with the cloud, if the cloud did not go before him to hide his brightness, oh, the whole world would be scorched. There would be no seven-year tribulation. There would be no time of Jacob's trouble. Everyone would melt, <laughs> except for the body of Christ, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we're going to be transformed, glorified. We're going to be able to enter into his presence, because we're going to receive new bodies. Hallelujah. But everyone in flesh and bones, <laughs> everyone in flesh and bones, if he did not hide himself with the cloud, Oh, there would be no seven-year tribulation because everyone who was not born again would utterly be consumed in a moment just at the brightness of his glory. But because God is all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, he's already told us his plan. And so when he comes out of his chamber, he's going to wrap himself in a cloud. <laughs> And when he wraps himself in a cloud, he's going to give the inhabitants of the world a good shaking. Oh, the greatest shaking in all of human history. So great and so terrible will that earthquake be that the mountains and the islands will be moved. So great and so terrible will that shaking be that the Bible says all the fishes of the sea 
will shake. All the birds of the heavens will shake. All the things that creep upon the ground will shake. And everyone who is left behind will shake at his presence. That's what the Bible says. That's Bible. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Look at Ezekiel chapter 38. It's right there. Look at Revelation chapter 16. It's right there. Look at Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal. It's right there. <laughs> Look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. It's right there. Look at Isaiah chapter 24. It's right there. It's the greatest earthquake in human history. And it happens when God utters his voice. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. <laughs> but the Lord will be the hope of his people. Oh, yes, you will. And the strength of the children of Israel. <laughs> Look at the two trumpets right here. Because remember, when John heard the trumpet sound, it was the voice of Jesus Christ. And right here in Joel chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible tells us that the Lord is going to roar out of Zion, first trumpet, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, second trumpet. Joel chapter 2, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, first trumpet. Joel chapter 2, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, second trumpet. And so when these two trumpets are sounded, the rapture happens for those who are ready. But for those who are left behind, when the Lord roars out of Zion and he utters his voice from Jerusalem, the heavens and the earth will shake. That's going to be the perspective of everyone who hasn't been born again. But when the bridegroom goes forth out of his chamber, the bride is going to come out of her closet. Down here, we've been going through a dress rehearsal, a dress rehearsal for the last 2,000 years. We do it at communion. We do it every time we come together and we meet. We do it every time we have fellowship. And we've been having a dress rehearsal for the last 2,000 years, waiting for this day when the church, the body of Christ, will finally be caught up. And when that day happens, it's going to be the real thing. It's the real shebang. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we're going to meet our Lord in the air. We're going to meet our Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I wanted to say one more thing. There was a lot more to this teaching, but let me just highlight this fact. Because I want to tie this back in to 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, verse 8. Paul says, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Okay? So remember, there's going to be two trumpets blown that's going to call the body of Christ up. But if you're left behind, there's a whole lot more that's going to go down. As we see here in Joel chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. <laughs> you see, now here goes another sound that's going to happen on the cloudy and dark day. We see this in Numbers chapter 10, because remember, there's two silver trumpets, but uh, there's different sounds that the two silver trumpets make. And so God tells us about another type of sound that, this trumpet makes and it says this in numbers chapter 10 verse 9 and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets and you shall be remembered before the lord your god and you shall be saved 
from your enemies. Those first two trumpets that are going to be blown is going to be the rapture. But if you're left behind, there's also going to come the sound of an alarm. <laughs> and when that sound of an alarm happens, that's a totally different type of trumpet. Because now it's time for war. <laughs> Gog and Magog. And the fall of Babylon the Great. <laughs> It's the day of trouble. I'm not going to get too far off into that, but everything is happening right before our eyes. Right now, what's happening in the spiritual, we see the chess pieces moving. We see the war of words. And God tells us exactly what to look for when they say peace and safety. <laughs> look at that Trump peace plan. Oh, my goodness. It's coming down the pipe quick, fast, and in a hurry. I wanted to talk about that in this teaching, but nevertheless, let me just highlight it here because Joel chapter 3 talks about when that alarm is sounded. That alarm is sounded because the land of God has been parted. And when the land of God is parted, that is when all of this happens. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. It's a day of trouble, my friends. A day of trouble that you want no part of. You see, because right now, we're right here. We're right here at the church age when the Spirit of God has been poured out upon all flesh. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he gave that awesome sermon through the power of the Holy Ghost and 3,000 were saved, he quoted this scripture that the Spirit of God would be poured out, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is given to anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus. And right now, this is where we're at. But when that trumpet sounds, when that trumpet sounds, then verse 30 is going to happen. Oh my goodness, you don't want to be around for that. You don't want to be around when God shows his wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The only way of escape is to give your life to Jesus Christ. There's so much more I wanted to say, but you know, God wanted me to say what I said. So praise his holy name. I pray that it was edifying for you. I pray that God is continuing to build you up. And I pray that you would, we would all keep the main things, the main things, you know, YouTube is just one section of our community in the Christian community, and, you know, uh, it's a wonderful community. And I'm thankful for this avenue that God has given us to come together. And I pray that as we learn from each other, we wouldn't be caught up in petty fights and bickering about who's right and who's wrong, but we would keep the main things, the main things, which is that Jesus Christ is Lord. As long as we confess that he is Lord and we believe in our hearts that he has risen from the dead. We shall be saved. Just keep things the main things, man. I mean, just come on. We're in this together. We're brothers and sisters forever. But if you're preaching a different Jesus, okay. A Jesus like the Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons or you're talking about Esau from Muslims, okay, well, well now you're talking about a totally different Jesus. But if we're talking about God in the flesh, born of a virgin, died on the cross, took our sin upon himself, even though he knew no sin, because he is the sinless lamb of God. If we're talking about him who conquered death, if we're talking about that Jesus, we can have fellowship. Okay? Because we're on the same team. We're in a fixed fight, and we can't lose. If you don't know him, give your heart to Jesus Christ, because he's coming soon. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has risen him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Please pray for me. As I travel back to San Diego, 
I've been out here in Atlanta for the last week since I preached that sermon last week, visiting my dad. And so I'm traveling back tomorrow as I upload this video tonight. Please keep me in your prayers and my family. And I pray that everyone out there, that God will answer your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, and that you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed and highly favored, that his grace will be shed upon you broadly and widely and abundantly, and that he will give you the fullness of the Holy Spirit as he anoints you with the fresh and the new anointing that destroys every yoke. Because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. Therefore, come unto him, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Maranatha! Amen.